Thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathapindika's Park. Now on that occasion, the wanderer, Ugahamana Samanamandikaputa, was staying in Malika's Park, the single hold Tinduka plantation for the philosophical debates. And together with a large following of wanderers, with as many as 300 wanderers, he was there. <clears throat> the carpenter Panjakanga <clears throat> went out from Sawati at midday in order to see the Blessed One. But then he thought, it is not right to see the Blessed One. He is still in retreat. <clears throat> and it is not right the right time uh, to see the bhikkhus worthy of esteem, for they are also still in retreat, sitting for the day, is what he's talking about. And suppose I went to Malika's park, to the wanderer, Ugamahana, Samana Mandikaputta. And so he went to Malika's park to listen to the wanderer speak. <clears throat> Now, it was on that occasion that the wanderer, Ugamahana, was seated with a large assembly of wanderers who were making an, quite an uproar, loudly and noisily talking many kinds of pointless talk, such as talking about kings and robbers, ministers and armies, dangers and battles and food and drink, clothing and beds and garlands and perfumes, relatives and vehicles, towns and cities, countries, women and heroes, streets and wells, the dead, trifles, the origin of the world, the origin of the sea, whether things are so or not so. Hmm. And the wanderer Ugamahana, Samanamandikaputta, saw the carpenter Panjakanga. He was coming in the distance into the park. And seeing him, he quieted his own assembly thus. Sirs, he said, be quiet. Sirs, make no noise. Here comes the carpenter Panjakanga. He is a disciple of the recluse Gotama. He is one of the recluse Gotama's white clothed lay disciples and staying at Sawati. These venerable ones like quiet. They are disciplined in their quiet. They commend quiet. Perhaps if he finds assembly a quiet one, he will think to join us. So the wanderers all became quiet. Now the carpenter Panjakanga, he went to the wanderer Ugamahana and he exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and the wanderer Ugamahana then said to him, Carpenter, when a man possesses four qualities, I describe him as an accomplished one in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, an ascetic, invincible, attained to the supreme attainment. What are the four? Here, he does no evil bodily actions. He utters no evil speech. He has no evil intentions, and he does not make his living by any evil livelihood. 
So when a man possesses these four qualities, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, an ascetic, invincible, attained to the supreme attainment. And then the carpenter Panjakanga, he neither approved nor disapproved of this wanderer, Uga Mahana's words. And without doing either, he rose from his seat and he went away, thinking that I shall learn the meaning of this statement in the presence of the Blessed One. So this is a routine thing going on at the time the Buddha was teaching. And amongst the, the lay people would listen to various teachers and then they would take the information of what they heard and go and report to the Buddha word for word what was said and ask him what it means to find out they were finding out is he teaching the same way as the Buddhist teaching, or is it different? If it is different, how is it different? And so the carpenter went to speak to the Buddha. So he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side, and he reported to the Blessed One his entire conversation with the wanderer, Ugamahana. And thereupon, the Blessed One said, now if that were so, Carpenter, what he said, if that were so, then a young tender infant lying prone is accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, an ascetic, invincible, attained to the supreme attainment, according to this wanderer, Ugamahana's statement. For the young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion of a body. So how should he do any evil bodily action beyond mere wriggling? And a young, tender infant lying prone does not even have any notion of speech. So how should he utter evil speech beyond his mere whining? And a young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion of any intention yet. So how should he have evil intentions beyond mere sulking? That young, tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion of a livelihood. So how should he make his living by evil livelihood beyond being suckled at his mother's breast. If that were so, Carpenter, then this young, tender infant lying prone accomplished, would be accomplished equally in what is wholesome and perfected in what is wholesome, an ascetic invincible attained to the supreme attainment. According to the wanderer Ugamahana's statement, and when a man possesses four qualities, Carpenter, I describe him not as accomplished in what is wholesome or perfected in what is wholesome or an ascetic who is invincible attained to a supreme attainment, but as one who stands in the same category as the young, tender infant who is lying prone. What are the four? Here, he does no evil bodily actions. He utters no evil speech. He has no evil intentions. He does not make his living by an evil livelihood. And when a man possesses these four qualities, I describe him not as accomplished, but as one who stands in the same category as the young infant who is lying prone. 
The Buddha then continues to talk further about this. When a man possesses 10 qualities, carpenter, 10, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, and ascetic, invincible, attained to the supreme attainment. But first of all, I say, it must be understood thus. These are the wholesome, ha unwholesome habits. And thus, unwholesome habits originate from this. And thus, unwholesome habits cease without remainder here. And thus, one practicing in the way, in this way, is practicing the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits. And I say, it must be understood thus. These are the wholesome habits, and thus, wholesome habits originate from this. And thus, wholesome habits will cease without remainder here. And thus, one practicing in this way would be practicing in the way to the cessation of the, un, the, whole, uh, the cessation of wholesome habits. And I say that it must be understood thus, these are the unwholesome intentions, thus the unwholesome intentions originate from this, and the, thus the unwholesome intentions cease without remainder here, and thus one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of unwholesome intentions. And then I say it must be understood thus, these are wholesome intentions, and wholesome intentions originate from this, and thus wholesome inten intentions cease without remainder here. And thus, when practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of the wholesome intentions. Let's look at this just for a minute. If you're practicing in a way where you are understanding there is a source or cause for what is happening each step of the way in human cognition. You're looking into this the way the Buddha was looking into it. And he's really talking about the beginning of all this when we talk about how he presents it to uh, the, the students that he's teaching. I told you before, First of all, the Four Noble Truths are his guidance system for his investigation. So remember the Four Noble Truths, anybody here who hasn't heard this, the Four Noble Truths are there is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is a cessation of suffering, and there is a way to the cessation of suffering. When we talk about going and using this for the map, of your investigation in your meditation, we're saying, okay, when something arises, that is the suffering. And then when you're learning about hindrances, for instance, that arise, these distractions, you want to learn the cause of the arising of this hindrance or this distraction. And then you're working to learn how to have the cessation of the distraction happen. So we're following the instructions in the practice of how we are solving the problem when we're practicing TWIM. We're following the four steps of right effort, okay? So these noble truths are a guidance line for what you're, whatever's happening inside, no matter whether you're in the beginning part of your meditation or the advanced, more deep, deep, deep levels of the meditation, you're still coming into the interview with the same question. What was that? How did that happen? I was very still. I thought there was nothing going on in my mind. How, how did that even happen? That little movement inside happen when I'm in the deeper states? And then how did this cessation happen? Did I do something for the cessation to happen? What actually occurred? Okay, 
In the deeper states, when we're working very deeply, the practice itself is ingrained in us already. The mind has usually started to practice the six steps that are in the six R's, which is recognizing that an unwholesome distraction comes up and starts pulling our attention away. And then we release it. We relax, but mind is doing it. Release and relax, smile a little bit and come back and keep watching inside what happens next. And it, it, it floats away, floats away. By then, I will say this, when you're in the deeper states, you've had a lot of hearing us talk about the uh, distractions, the uh, Nuwarana. We've spoken a lot to you about looking closely, very closely at the cause of these distractions, what it is that makes them operate, how do they operate, and then this is all a matter which you'll get to in the sutta sort of in a minute because when you hear how the Buddha is talking about this versus the other teacher, you're going to hear it a little bit different. But we're showing you the key to the distraction in your meditation. We don't want to hear about the dark night of the soul and that you're stuck with your distractions for six or seven months. We don't want to hear it. The only reason you're stuck is because you are attempting to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, suppress them, and subdue them. So I am trying to make them stop so I can do my meditation and I can proceed and make Nibbana happen. Oops, oops, doesn't happen, does it? Doesn't work, it doesn't work. So what was the opposite? The opposite was to learn what is it that's feeding that hindrance and what does it turn out to be? It turns out to be one of the primary pieces you have to learn in the process of learning the Dhamma. It has to do with anicca, whatever arises, passes away. And you know it's the suffering because it made you stop watching and got you uptight and you started watching the distraction. But the third part was anatta. The anatta is the opposite of the food of the hindrance. If I leave it alone and I don't concern myself or take it prized personally anymore, I have done something significant. I have stopped the supply line for the hindrances to come and bother you anymore. I have taken their food away and they will not come back. They'll stop coming back if I commit myself not to pay attention of the hindrances. What are these hindrances in relationship to life? And the hindrances in relationship to life can be the depression, falling into the depression, falling into grief and sadness, depression, and then not wanting to go anywhere, see anyone, do anything, because I just am engulfed in this. But is this attacking you? Do you believe it comes down to, do you believe life is happening to you? Or have you discovered something the Buddha uncovered? Nothing is happening to you. Everything that is occurring is happening from you. Now, one student came to me one time and said, oh my gosh, that means it's all my fault. I'm to blame, it's all my fault. I said, no, 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 you're looking at it the wrong way. It's not anybody's fault. It's all it is, is unveiling the secret of how things actually work. See, nothing is happening to you. If you understand everything is happening from you, what does that do? All of a sudden, you can say, I know a secret. Ha <laughs> ha, I know a secret. I'm in charge. I am actually powerful. Can't hear, when I say that, when you're riding the bike, well, let's do it with your car. 
you're driving your car and something goes wrong. And it's very annoying to women. It's very annoying. Most of us don't know what to do with the engine, right? And we try to fix it. We don't know what to do. Most women don't know what to do. And isn't it irritating when you have to go and get the guy to tow the car and you go to the garage, he opens up the hood and looks inside and he says, oh, well, that's just a matter of tuning this. And he takes some kind of tool like this and he goes in there and says, let me just do that for you. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And then you start the car now and you start the car and it's fine. And you just had to pay $35 or $40 to, to tow the car and fix it. It's annoying, it's annoying. But it's just because you didn't know how it works. It was a very simple fix. Wasn't anything major. But he knew because he knew the sound of the car and he knew how the car works and he knew how the engine sounds and he knows how when it's broken, it squeaks or it squeaks or it squawks or it goes like that. You know, and then that means which tool do I go one time and get $40? See? <laughs> So it's quite funny, you know, we're so frustrated that way. The hindrances, I'm not being sacrilegious here, but they're not a big problem. If you will just pause and understand that you are powerful enough to fix this, if you know how they work. And then the second piece is, do you understand the Buddha was probably the father of cognitive psychology and the father of neurocognitive science. Yeah, he was. In cognitive psychology, that means we look at everything happening that's going on that's making us feel awful. It's not really making us feel it awful. It's the way that we're perceiving it. Yeah, it's the way that we're perceiving it. So we have a choice here, and this is the volition in Buddhism. Somebody said there's no choice in Buddhism. There's no free will. I said the point, you don't understand how this is all operating, but if you understand all of the pieces, you begin to understand the Buddha was showing you how to be the most powerful you could be and in charge more than anyone else because we're gonna show you how everything works. And you're the only one in a room of 100 people that know how stuff is really working that makes you pretty powerful, doesn't it? So this is what's happening here. And first thing he does with a person when he's trying to teach you, he try, he's telling you from the beginning, and Bonte very often in the very first lesson he teaches the beginners, class if everybody in there is beginning. What is the human being? He starts there. He says, first of all, there are these five aggregates. They're made up of five aggregates or pieces to make this human being, okay? They have a body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness, that's the human being right there. Body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. Body means from the top of your head to your toes. This important. Well, how important is it, someone said. Ananda went to the Buddha once. Ananda was his attendant. He says to the Buddha, Lord, where is the world? Where is the world? It was a simple question. What does the Buddha say? Does he get into a big sutta about it? No, he looks at Ananda, he says. The world exists between the top of your head and your feet. It's the whole world. It's the whole world. What does he mean? If nothing is happening to you, everything is happening from you. That means each day you create your own experience in the existence each day. That's what happens. It's like there's a magic white 
uh, canvas behind me and in the morning you decide to start painting it and you could choose your colors in the morning if you want and then remember you chose pinks and bright greens and yellows and stuff and leave the blacks and browns and grays at home if you want and do the whole painting today that way you can play a game with this each night you come back to sit in your meditation, you look at what you painted during the day, and there it is on the magic canvas. And then you sit, go to sleep. When you get up tomorrow, it's white again. This is the person who's living in today and making decisions for today in each present time activity during the day and then at the end of the day, leaves that and goes to sleep. And the next day they get up and they live again. You are the ones who are actually painting your own existence. The way that you want to see the world now is actually inside you right now, waiting to come out. You make a decision and you know this is a game. Make it a game. There's nobody says you can't have fun doing this. It's really fun. And see if it doesn't help you to go through your day and keep working through the principles of what he's teaching you as you're going. In other words, keep it impersonal. Don't be judgmental. Try to see things as they are. Do one thing at a time. Look towards loving kindness and compassion. I'm going out of line here with the suit, but all these things you start learning about apply them and as you change the world the then you change your behavior your behavior starts affecting the energy of it starts affecting people around you and one man said to me oh i can't affect anybody else that's silly and i said really <laughs> you know you should come with me to the store uh, to buy the food when we were back home, to buy the supplies and get in line on a Friday. And uh, there's a lot of people trying to get their food and get home for the weekend. Everybody's a big line waiting and there's a new cashier and she's causing things to slow down. And there's a baby in a carriage in front of me. And there's a mother who's trying to help the cashier get this stuff out, but trying to make the baby happy because the baby's making 40 people around her upset because the baby's upset. They're upset. See? So what can you do about it? <laughs> All you have to do is smile at the baby, wink at the baby, play hide and seek with the baby. <laughs> And all of a sudden the baby stops crying. Then you compliment the mother and say, what a beautiful child you have, just beautiful. And now mom relaxes. Mothers love to hear about how wonderful their children are, right? And then the cashier is catching up and she's okay. And now all 40 people around you are, are okay smiling at you because you're smiling at the baby who's smiling at the mother and the cashier who's smiling at the people and everybody's smiling. What just happened? Well, my energy having fun with the situation changed the baby, the mother, the cashier, and all of that changed the people around the situation. You do ex affect people around you. You do. When you become happy, other people in the office become happy. If you are the office manager and you're happy and energetic and more up, all of a sudden the production in the whole office goes up with 15 people around you. That's what happened with one lady who was practicing in New York in a big construction company. She took an online retreat and then all the production in the office changed because she was happier and she began to realize she has some control on what's happening with her feelings. One of the hardest things for us when we're going through a tough time is understanding the Buddhist principle about feeling is not emotion. Now this gets the Western psychologist all upset <laughs> because the Western psychologist wants you to just, if you're depressed, just let that go. Or if you feel down or suicide, just let that go. It's not that easy to let that go. 
But if you understand how that's happening, how it's operating, you have got the inside track. You understand what engine and how it works in the car, like you see, all of a sudden you know something nobody else knows. And you can, but this helps you in life. This is helping you because when everybody else is going crazy and upset, you can keep a sane mind because you can see whatever is going on isn't going to be there forever. It's a Nietzsche, you know that, so it's going to pass. So you can calm down there and you can have be the one that calms down everybody else because you look carefully at what's going on and see what's really essentially going on. And you let go of all the other stuff in your mind about what this might be like and how it was before and this might happen and that might happen in the future and all that stuff. You have to let it go. Why do you go through a heavy time in life when all you have to carry around is what's right around you in the present time? Why are you carrying such a heavy load when if you stop for 10 minutes and just look at what that is that's in your mind, that's from what happened back here or what might happen over here. But what is happening right now was never that heavy. That's what's important. So he tells you there's five aggregates and the body is from the head to the toe. Then he says to you, feeling. And all you need to know about feeling is that when a feeling arises, it's either pleasant or painful or neutral. Even two of them can take you as far as experiencing an opening in your mind, pleasant or painful, okay? That's really true. And there's sutras that support that, okay? But how does the feeling happen, you say? Well, you have six sense doors. This is the next part. He tells you there are six sense doors in your body. And five of those sense doors experience everything that happens outside of you. You see, you hear, you smell, you taste, and you touch with sense, sense, uh, sensual touch, okay? You have a sixth one, which is mind inside your mind, okay? So how does this really work? Well, my eye sees this glass. My eye sees color and form first in the process of seeing. And then perception jumps in and says glass. So perception is a tiny piece that's involved with when I see this color and form, it flips it from color and form into an object with a name. If you want to get excited about this, you go visit a two-year-old who's learning words really fast and you watch how you got your dictionary in your head. That's how you got it. The children are learning the words really fast, yeah? It's fun to see the baby get to that point and go into the dictionary. So the eye sees color and form. Perception says glass. Each one of the sense doors uses the consciousness link in uh, the link in dependent origination as the eye takes some of it for eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness. It's different. You don't have tongue consciousness working in the eye. You don't have a nose consciousness working in the tongue. You don't, don't have that. So you have these fields of consciousness. So the eye just sees the color and form. Perception says glass. The eye plus the color and the glass, what the sight is, and the, and the consciousness makes contact happen. There's contact. We contact as condition of feeling arises, felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. See? Now, once you have that, we can get a little bit of verse from the Chichaka Sutta tells us, if one welcomes it, delights in it, and remains holding to it when it comes up, then 
one is touched with lust. And if one doesn't want it and have anything to do with it, then that's the painful feeling and that's touched with aversion. So here we have a pulling or a pushing feeling that you can relate to from heart and mind how this is going on, okay? Okay, then the next thing that happens is this craving occurs. Now craving doesn't have to occur, but it will, it occurs. And it's happening because I like it and want it and move towards the attachment, or I don't like it, I don't want it, and I push away with aversion towards it, you see? Okay, so this is what's happening. Now suppose we have uh, the next piece is the part about the craving that's so important is that in the story of Buddhism, the first thing we learn is the suffering comes from craving. Craving is the cause of suffering. But if we say that, we have to learn what is craving. And this was a dilemma today. This is a dilemma because not everybody is willing to tell you what craving is. They don't quite know how to talk about it. I think Bhante's done a very good job with this because when you work with the dependent origination, the seven links, and something happens and a feeling comes up and you feel the craving happen, there's always a tightening that happens. And so we say craving always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. Now, it's true that you won't always be able to feel this happening when it's if you have tension already in your body to a certain extent you have to have more tension in the craving than is in your body already to 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 register the craving yeah but that's how it's working and as you reduce the craving with your practice of the tranquil wisdom insight meditation and how are you doing that well when something came up if it was distracting you, you recognize it came up or it feels like it's getting tight, you immediately let go, relax, smile, and come back to sending the metta and working with the metta and compassion. If you do it that way, each time you do it that way, something is happening that's important. You are purifying your mind. You are letting go. And then we relax we relax, smile, and come back. The relaxed step is letting go and relax. I'm sorry, releasing and relaxing is letting go and dropping, letting go of it. Then you smile and come back. That's the uplifting part. The smile is the easiest, wholesome thing you can take hold of to get back to your object of meditation and keep going. The easiest one. So what's wrong with just throwing it away and, and coming back? Well, the problem is if you throw it away, push it away or throw it away or get angry at it, you've made more tension. Or what's wrong with just releasing it and coming back right away? Well, then you don't reduce the tension level. And if you don't keep dropping the tension level, you never get to the point where you can fall into the, the first jhana and start moving down through the jhanas. You can't do that, okay? So it's all very balanced and it's very well documented and it's very much right there that when you release, you relax, smile and come back, you have let go of, recognize the unwholesome, let go of the unwholesome, relax, bring up a wholesome, come back and keep going with the most wholesome thing you can keep going with, right? Your meditation. So that's, that's how you did it. You did both parts of it. One and two and three and four. You did both parts of the process of purification. Can you purify the mind without coming back to the wholesome? No. If you just throw it away and come back, throw it away and come back without the relaxed step, you never reduce never reduce down, 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 down. And you want to keep going away, going away. So that's how it's happening. 
Okay, so the six sense doors, this works the same way with all six sense doors and you have the three kinds of feelings. So he's giving you this basis in the beginning. I'm using my four noble truths. I'm, this is what I'm composed of are these five aggregates. And now we did the body and we did the feeling. Perception, we said names things, it's your dictionary, your floating dictionary in your head. It tells you what everything is, okay? Thoughts are arising automatically from the brain. And it's an interesting thing that I had to start telling some people once in a large group. There is nowhere in the text that we can find that says that you're supposed to stop your brain from making thoughts happen. Nowhere. Isn't that interesting? And yet we have created this idea sometimes about we have to stop the thoughts. No, no, allow them. You see all these funny things on the wall behind me? I didn't appreciate this last week, but all of those are thoughts that are going on in my brain while I'm talking to you. But I don't need to chase them away because each one of them, when they happen and they arise, they have this much of a life and what affects them is a Nietzsche. They're going to go away. It's too bad I can't change the color of them for you for next time. <laughs> You know, but the thing is, they're just popping up all over the place. What is it that feeds them and makes them into a hindrance is the moment you personally pay attention to them, they turn into a distraction. And the more you get involved with them, which is gratification, that's the part of the gratification. They turn into a real problem. So don't feed them. Don't feed them anymore. You see? Okay. The, um, let's go on with the sutta from here and I want you to see, okay, we did the body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and the last one is consciousness. And consciousness is just simple to explain. It's like there's a big swimming pool inside you. <laughs> and it has all the consciousness you need for your entire life, but it's a big swimming pool. When you say formations consciousness, you know, ignorance formations consciousness, consciousness is a floating tank of consciousness, which then is nothing really there until it's activated through a sense door. Get it? Okay. So eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness, if you're suffering from sitting there and having thoughts come up, don't pay attention to them, let them go. And if it's something, I'll tell you something else. If it is grief, grief is a kind of pain. Grief is a painful, a mental pain. That's what it, it's the mental pain and you have the physical pain. In 140, you'll find, Sutta number 140, you will find the description for sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Pain is the pain of the body. Grief is the mental pain that is happening in your mind. But both pains do one particular thing in the injury of a body, uh, this person who's dying of the sarcoma or the cancer and has a lot of pain, pain develops, and you, this is something you can look at the Mayo pain, pain Clinic, it explains it. Pain doesn't just come up and go like that and go, come up and go like that and go. It's not how it works. If you break a leg or break a bone, it's very painful for the bone to heal. But remember, it's healing. That's why you can get through it, because if the pain is there, it's, it's healing, okay? But the thing is, how do I handle that? Well, you can adapt to that occurring in the body if you learn that whatever's wrong and is healing in your body has a pattern that goes up and it comes here and it always goes like that, like that. Like that, like that, 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 and that. And it goes, and there's a pause, and then it does it again. And that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that. Every time it's gonna be the same. It's a very strange thing. And this is true with grief, only grief is more sneaky. I can lie in bed when I'm healing my body and go through pains like that when a tree fell on me and I had an accident with a truck and other things, okay? But grief is worse because grief will hit you any time of the day. You can be doing the accounts and grief hits you and overwhelms you, but 
Let's talk about what's true about the grief. It has a pattern too, and it's coming, and it will come and do something and form a pattern, and then it'll go. So how do I go back to work if I'm overcome by grief? You find out what the pattern is, you identify it, and then you go and you continue to work, but when it comes, you smile. Why? Because this is coming through again, and you know it's going to be there, and it will eventually fade out. But don't feed it. If you dive into it, you can become overwhelmed by it. Don't feed it, because it's waiting for you to pay attention to it. And that's the trick to this. It can hit you when you're driving, it can hit you when you're walking, when you're working at the office or a bank and you're trying to go back to work. It's very difficult. But you say, oh, that's grief. Okay, it's grief. I'm gonna allow grief to run its course and you let it go. And then as you're working with it, it identifies that you're not going to feed it and it gets less and less. There's nothing wrong with this. It isn't something you need to stop because physically it can cause problems in your body if you try to suffocate grief. It's a very bad thing to do. So we allow it to do what it needs to do naturally, just the way when you fall at first, you have a big bang. You allow that to come up and down. And when a tree fell on me at one point, I lay there until people came to lift the tree off and watched what was happening with this whole thing. There was no place I could go, nothing else to do. So I lay there and I watched all the stuff he told me about happening in the body with the injury and everything and watched it. So I'm telling you, this is really the truth, okay? Okay, let's go back into the sutta um, here. So he is talking about once practicing this way, um, wait, wait, how far do we go here, down here? Once these are unwholesome intent, you can unwholesome intentions, understood that these are wholesome un un uh, intentions, unwholesome intentions originate from this and they go, uh, and thus the unwholesome intentions cease without remaining. And then he starts explaining how um, all of these things that are occurring, the intentions, and the, the painful this and the unpainful and un unpleasant and the intentions coming and going. He's showing you something. He's not going deeply into the dependent origination here. He's just explaining how whatever is happening, it comes from this and then it goes away. He, he's pointing to something, it's coming up here. What are unwholesome habits? The, they are unwholesome bodily actions, unwholesome verbal actions, evil, uh, livelihood or lifestyle, and, and we say lifestyle, it's a little broader way of saying it, a uh, uh, um, harmonious lifestyle or unharmonious lifestyle is how you set things up in your life so that you have a chance to balance your spiritual needs along with your living needs. What do these unwholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated they should be said to originate from mind. Now he's getting to the core of the teaching. He's saying everything is coming from mind. What mind, though, though mind is multiple, it is varied and it's different aspects, people to people, because of how you grew up. There is mind affected by lust, by hate, and by delusion to different degrees with different people. Unwholesome habits will originate from this. When we go in that direction, we feed it and we continue to go in that unwholesome direction. So the part that's interesting with uh, Buddha Gautama is he's telling you information, that the knowledge that you have to use it, not just to read it, learn it, go home and try and just live life, but to take it into life and all the stuff he's telling you is um, affecting in the life. And where do these unwholesome habits cease without remainder? The cessation is stated here, a student abandons bodily misconduct, develops good bodily misconduct. How? By following the precepts. He sticks to his precepts. He abandons verbal misconduct, develops good verbal, misconduct, verbal conduct. 
He abandons mental misconduct and develops good mental conduct. He abandons wrong lifestyle or livelihood the, the occupation and gains a living by right livelihood. The livelihood issue is to not be true, not to be involved with um, the three, the poisons or killing or trafficking in human beings, okay, was the traditional way of explaining this. But the deeper meaning of it is to understand anything you're doing in life where you're feeling guilty about it or the company's not honest and they're having a product they want you to sell. I had a student who was selling something. He knew perfectly well that the product was no good, but he was selling it to people. And he felt so guilty, he finally abandoned this and went to another firm and went to work and then he was fine he was fine but it's when you're involved in something where you stumble across the company is breaking the precepts and breaking the rules and trying to profiteer on people for the wrong reasons if you stay there you're going to feel heavy you're going to feel part of it that's what happens and we we have to make a decision what we're going to do at that time it is here that unwholesome habits will cease without remainder. Now, what happened in this paragraph that's interesting is that he's telling you, if this is there, then you go the opposite way. If this is happening, you give it up and go here each time. You see, you leave the unwholesome side, you go to the wholesome side. So now we're repeating the Doi de Vitaka Sutta, okay, number 19, where when he, before he was a Buddha, he's talking about wholesome thoughts and unwholesome thoughts and i'll try living here for a few weeks i'll try living here for a few weeks and i'll see how it goes and if it doesn't go well i'm going to live over here and that was the wholesome side went much better and worked much better the interesting part about what the buddha teaches is that he's testing everything and there are suttas that will come across where he's telling you if you don't test it you should leave the, the camp leave the school I want you to ask questions and I want you to test everything. Because what is direct knowledge? He claims to be the one that is teaching by direct knowledge. That is knowing by seeing. So he teaches you a practice where you can know things for sure by seeing and experiencing them. Now this one has an interesting little slam because I was talking to three people once, a lawyer, um, a governor, a general, and a, and a writer. There were four of them. And the, the judge, there was a judge and a lawyer. Yeah, judge and lawyer, a doctor, and a painter. And the judge was the one who said, well, isn't it true all you really have to do is you should just go to an island unto yourself and stay there, and then you'll figure out everything. And I went like this, okay, okay but don't go to the island until you have the instructions, <laughs> okay? That's what we learned. We learned you can't, you, it would be, you might be the next Buddha and maybe you would figure it out if you went to an island by yourself, but don't let anybody tell you running away to the island and pushing the boat away and staying there by yourself away from the world is how you're gonna figure it out unless you have the instructions. And now he comes into, Gotama comes into this part here. The Buddha says, okay, how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of the unwholesome habits? How does he do that? Here, now I'm gonna change some of these words and I'll explain it to you in a minute. Here, the student awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. He makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. Second, he awakens enthusiasm for the abandoning of the arisen, evil, unwholesome states. And he also makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. The then third step, he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance, non-disappearance, and strengthening and increase and fulfillment of the development of the arisen wholesome states. That's the third step. And the fourth step is he makes effort, 
I'm sorry, and he makes effort and arouses energy and strives, okay. Um, so in this, he's talking right effort. He's showing you six R's is what he's doing, okay? That's why the practice is working, because this is right effort, and it is um, right striving. Now, in the text, right striving and right effort are the same precise paragraphs. Nothing is different at all. You can check this yourself if you play with the uh, index on this one and go see all the places where it says right effort and all the places it says right striving, okay? What I want to make clear is when we, we change the word zeal to enthusiasm, because that's really what it is. The reason we took away zeal is because of evangelical Christians. <laughs> and you know, the hallelujah, you know, and all this. This zeal is a Christian thing. It's a Christian word and we didn't want to leave it there because it doesn't mean the same thing. Uh, this zeal means enthusiasm. And if you go in the um, thesauruses, you're going to find it as a synonym. So the other thing that bothered some people that want to love to argue the point, he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. Okay, okay. Now, there's two ways in life to um, dig a hole, <laughs> dig a hole, okay, in the ground. You're digging a hole because let's say, well, the horse died and you have to dig the grave. Let's do it that way. And he died right outside the barn and you have to dig the hole. The first way is to get a shovel and start digging. But the wiser way is to go in town and rent the backhoe <laughs> and come in and just dig the hole and do the job and get finished, okay? What I'm trying to get across to you is the way a person applies effort and arouses energy, how he uses energy and exerts his mind by observing and discovering things and strives, the way these things are done depends on the person's knowledge of how to get things done. Isn't it true? It's true, yeah. So I, I can struggle at really hard to do something because I don't have knowledge about the easier way to do it. And so we have to investigate. We can't just take something like this and say, well, it's really important for me to stop the hindrance and press it down and subdue it and fight with it. It says right here, make effort, apply energy, exert my mind and strive to push it down and subdue it. But that person didn't read the suttas that explained how your hindrances affect your seven factors of enlightenment throughout your training and how if you treat the hindrance improperly the seven factors of enlightenment will not come up and become balanced but if you know that and you also understand what a nietzsche is why would you get upset about the distraction anyway because whatever comes up is going to pass away. And this is not the Buddha's law. This is a universal law. Everybody knows whatever arises, passes away. So it's using your intelligence, your, your knowledge of what you're, how you're all explained. The students with Punaji got a lot of this. And if you were working with Punaji at all, you learned a lot of what I'm talking about. And it's important not to go off the deep end, like the man who said the solution to suffering is I'm just never going to feel anything again. Oops. <laughs> Oops. The human being is not going to stop feeling. That's a game, and you're going to get sick if you try to do that. That's just not, it's non, non piece non, non knowledge is what I call it. Non knowledge, no knowledge there, okay? You cannot suppress things inside of you and expect not to get cancer and form tumors and have aneurysms and things like this, because this is what it's going to do to you if you try to suppress things. It's better for you to start looking at the, the reality of what is real and true about how things are working. Then you know you don't really have to do very much at all, but let it go. 
the best way to do this to see how I'm telling you the truth or not, the moment you start feeling tight, irritated, frustrated, or upset with somebody, just go, huh, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Never mind. In your head, you just go, never mind. And you come back out of it and realize this is not something that I can fix in the other person. You don't fix other people. You can only fix this. Fix yourself, what's around you. Kindergartens go to school, the kindergarten class, one of the biggest lessons is to learn your space with the kindergartners, you know? Can you learn your little space? You only have to take care of your space. And those little boys, oh, they're so difficult. <laughs> little girls kind of get it a little quicker, but look, can you get in line and learn your space? All you have to do is take care of your space. If you learn that, you learn, you're beginning to learn part of the what's essential and not unessential, okay? So this is how he's cleaning it up. He just told you, now what are the wholesome habits? They are wholesome bodily actions, wholesome verbal actions, and purification of livelihood. These are the wholesome habits. This is confirmed and supported in your precepts that we learned last week, okay? So by keeping your precepts, you're keeping your support system going, okay? And what do these wholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated they should be said to originate from mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied, and of different aspects, there is mind unaffected by lust and unaffected by hate or by a delusion. Wholesome habits originate from this. Now, one word here sticks out, and that's delusion. What is delusion? Delusion in Buddhism is the idea that everything that is happening, that you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think is part of me. Therefore, when I speak, I'm listening to you attack me, and my immediate thoughts how can I defend myself and I get on the defensive? Unfortunately, people jump to the conclusion everybody's doing that, but some of us are not doing that. We're just watching the other person struggle, you see, with, the, with this personal thing. The, one of the biggest sort of epiphanies you can have in Buddhism or awakening points or insights is to just forgive everything for a couple of days. I mean everything and watch what happens in your mind when a thought comes up or when a thought comes up that's pulling you down watch how the moment it comes up you go oh boy here it is again it's going to be like it was oh gosh what am I going to do it's coming again oh, it's pushing me down no no it's not it's just a single one remember I told you a little while ago I told you that the lightest way to live is in the present time so look at the, just for a split second, was that thought that came up from the past that it might have to be like it was before? It doesn't have to be like it was before. And if you don't pay attention, it'll get weaker and you can stop feeding it. So you occupy yourself doing something, learning something at home if you're staying inside. Do something new. Occupy your mind outside of what these present things that come up are, if they're bothering you, just let them go, relax, smile, and come back to what you're doing. Yeah? And where do these wholesome habits cease without remainder? The cessation is stated by the monk is virtuous, but he does not identify with his virtues. See the impersonal there? He doesn't, he's virtuous, but he doesn't get conceited over it or brag about it. He keeps his precepts, but he does not identify that it's me. He understands, as it actually is, that deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom at where these wholesome habits cease without remainder. They only do when you let go of the personal aspect. Nothing personal, okay? Now, watch the six R's again. And how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of the wholesome habits? 
Here, the monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen evil wholesome states, where the continuance, non-disappearance, and strengthening and increase in fulfillment of the development. He did the, I, did, I skipped reading the whole thing, but what he's doing is he identifies. Now, my question the first time I saw this was, why would I want to practice for the cessation of my wholesome habits? I'm wondering about that. When you're coming into the practice and you're starting out, you're looking at letting go of the unwholesome habits, bringing up the wholesome and building them. And this is like a pendulum. Do you know what a pendulum is? Where we have the piece up here and it's, you're at the, you are say, you're at the, um, you're at the, well, let me do this to you. You're at the nine, okay? And you want, I want you to be at the six. So I try to pull you to the three and it's swinging until finally in the end, you end up at the six. And that would be with neither wanting and pushing to get or having aversion and pushing away. So you're setting yourself up first. You dismiss the unwholesome mind states and unwholesome habits and you bring up the wholesome to pull yourself over pull yourself over and you're in good shape and your mind is clear and you have a lot of knowledge and you see how everything works and then it slips down and falls into the position of the six now you're in a position where it's not so scary i let go of that what happens if i let go of this and then i am not there so much anymore and then I'm sitting there just calm and open. And it's very, very powerful because now you have this knowledge of how things work. Your, your fear is gone. You're not afraid of anything anymore. And now you're just watching, you see? So this is why this paragraph is here. And what are unwholesome intentions? They are the intention of sensual desire, the intention of ill will, the intention of cruelty, and they call the unwholesome intentions. What do these unwholesome intentions originate from? Their origin is stated. They should be said to originate from perception. And what perception? Though perception is multiple and varied of different aspects, there is perception of sensual desire, perception of ill will, and perception of cruelty, unwholesome intentions originate from this. And where do these unwholesome intentions cease without remainder? These, their cessation is stated here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. The student enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. It is here that the unwholesome intentions cease without remainder. Now, in that case, I changed a couple words because long time ago, we watched people. We were going to many, many retreats, you know. It make me sit in the front. I say, you know, when you say applied and sustained thought, nobody knows what you're talking about. They're going, uh. But if I say thinking, and examining thoughts, everybody goes, oh, okay, fine. So we, we told Bhikkhu Bodhi what we were doing. We went to New York and we had a talk with him about it. He sticks with this because, you know, you have to remember who he wrote for in the beginning. He didn't write for us. He wrote for the academics. All this is done in the academic field. So sometimes they use words the average person doesn't compute the right way. And the way we change words, we don't change meaning. What we change is we go to the thesaurus and find a synonym and test it out with people for a few hundred students and watch what happens and how do they respond to it. The other place is rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Rapture is not what's really, it's joy and it's an internal infusion of joy through the whole body. But if you get into rapture again, it's a Christian word and gets misconstrued. And then pleasure born of seclusion, it's happiness 
born of seclusion. Because each time you stop practicing, what is Buddhist happiness? Buddhist happiness is in inner contentment. It is not the happiness we have in normal conventional reality. It's a different kind of happiness. It's an inner contentment. What is the contentment? The contentment is the knowledge you've attained and understand. It makes you very contented because you know how something operates and you watch it and you see it and then you know it. And how practicing does he practice the way of cessation of unwholesome intentions and so forth awakens the uh, enthusiasm, uh, non-arising and uh, unarisen evil unwholesome states. And then he does the four steps of right effort again. They're cutting down these paragraphs so you don't have to read so much. You're doing all four of the steps. And you know, in six hours, we have the six steps to complete the four steps. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Okay, so you recognize the unwholesome, release the unwholesome, relax the mind, bring up the wholesome, keep the wholesome going, return to the object of meditation and keep it going. So there are six little pieces that actually complete the, the real thing is there's nothing wrong with the instructions that are in the text. The problem is understanding this, the instructions correctly, and then all of a sudden they start working. So there's nothing that's wrong. You, we don't dispute anything about where people go with this, but until you break down some of these words, a great deal of the problem has been looking in English and trying to talk about it in a second as English as a second language, teachers trying to tell English speakers what this means, it doesn't work real well. But we're not proficient in Pali, and there, there's this whole dilemma of some of the Pali cannot be translated uh, in, into English uh, conceptual words, and it's true, it's true. So he tells you how to let it go. And what are the wholesome intentions? They are intentions of renunciation, intentions of non-ill will, intentions of non-cruelty. What is non-ill will? That's loving kindness. What is non-cruelty? That is compassion. So whenever you see non-ill will, it's another way of saying metta and non-cruelty is the other way of saying compassion. These are the wholesome intentions. What do these wholesome intentions originate from? They originate, their origination is stated, they should be said to originate from perception, how you perceive it and you see it, and just the perception is multiple, varied, and different aspects, the perception of renunciation, perception of uh, loving kindness, or perception of compassion, and the wholesome intentions originate from this. And where do these uh, wholesome intentions cease without remainder? Their, their cessation is stated that here, with the stilling of the thinking and examining thought, the student enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and unification of mind without thinking and examining thoughts, with joy and happiness born of I always say born of productive concentration. The concentration word is the glut. It is the, oh my goodness. It is the mud hole, the place you get stuck where you're getting your tire and you can't get out. Too much concentration will not get you there. Too little concentration will not allow you to see. And the interesting part about this, I'm gonna throw this in, is when I went to the Vasudhi Maga to check this out, in the section in the Vasudhi Maga, if you have a, a copy of it, you look at the first page description on concentration, you're gonna find a, a, the a translation says, you're trying to develop a productive level of concentration. The only trouble with that is when you turn the page. <laughs> you turn the page and you start reading what it is they're saying concentration is, which contradicts what productive concentration is, and therefore it doesn't happen because everybody gets involved in the next few pages. And it's talking about a very hard, pressurized kind of concentration, which isn't good for you in many situations of emotional upset or things happening wrong in life. 
can be detrimental for you to try to do this with the concentration. But the gentle approach to solving problems such as uh, grief or sometimes the PTSD victim and things like that, very gently working with them with the Brahma Viharas first and then letting them go into breath later if they want to is very effective because it's very gentle and it doesn't demand this kind of thing, you see? So where do, uh, we said that part, <clears throat> and how practicing does he practice the way of cessation? And he repeats it, um, the, he repeats the six R's again. Now Carpenter, when a man dis possesses what 10 qualities do I describe as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected is in what is wholesome, and the ascetic is invincible and attained to the supreme attainment. The monk possesses the right view, the, um, we say, harmonious uh, perspective, and the right view is that things should be taken impersonally. And you can talk about this any way you want to get there, but when you say right view, unless you understand how this was, uh, perf this was um, tested and how it works, you have to practice not taking anything personally to understand how much easier it is when you just go through life and just don't take anything personally. You just have to see for yourself. And then it talks about um, the... Um, Okay, so you had the harmonious perspective. I'm sorry, where did I go here? I lost my place. Um, um, the right view of one that's beyond training and the right intention of one beyond training, the right speech and the one beyond training and the right action and one beyond training and the right li livelihood for one beyond training and the right effort for one beyond training, and the right mindfulness for one beyond training, and the right concentration beyond one training, and the right knowledge of one beyond training, and the right deliverance of one beyond training. And when a student possesses these 10 qualities, I will describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, and ascetic who is invincible, attained to the supreme attainment. He set himself up so he can go through all the way to the super mundane Nibbana experience. You see, this is what he's talking about. So of course we'll say harmonious um, perspective and then we'll say harmonious imaging in your mind. That's imaging in your mind. They've used harmonious thought, that, uh, right thought and they've used right intention, but we say harmonious imaging in your mind. The pictures you keep in your mind. You see, if you keep wholesome pictures in your mind to lift you up and wholesome memories of the person and let go of the other stuff, that's what's going to carry through, carry through for the person. If you grab onto this or take anything personally, oh, this was my fault, everything's my fault, it's the blame and everything else then it's a real pull down in the whole situation. And it's in, and you know, other, the other part of it is with, um, you know, my mother in her, she had cancer also. And when she, and when she was uh, breaking down and the demand she put on my sister and everything was driving my sister crazy, you know? And what happened was we went in to help her with the situation, but, the whole thing was she was grabbing hold of all the bad stuff. My sister was just grabbing hold of the bad stuff and suffering like unbelievably. You thought you had no choice. But look at this now. I gave you choices today, didn't I? I gave you choice to look in the direction of the uplifted things that are in your mind. And to choose the wholesome over the unwholesome, to let it go, relax, smile, and come back. Smile, laugh at the, the, the brain. The brain is taking a game on you and playing games with you by, by presenting stuff to see what you'll do with it. 
And so if you have the knowledge of if I feed it, it will get worse and it will get stronger and then it will stay there longer. Then why are we feeding it anymore? But we do these things. Everybody does these things. But you have to play with this as if you're in a laboratory to understand this whole experience. And when you're coming to listen to what we're doing, you should come to it and listen, you know, and say, well, what if that's the way it is? And then go test it out for yourself. That's what I did. I didn't believe anything. Of course, Bhante, in very early of training with me, said, I don't want you to believe me, you know, when I tell you stuff. <laughs> don't believe me. Everything you learn, you have to test. I'm going to show you how to test it. He went to Thailand. He went and stayed for months in the cave. I didn't have to do that. <laughs> okay. And I, I went to, I had my own. I, I did other things in Sri Lanka and other places. But the point is, he did the hard part of fishing around with this stuff. And then we realized when we talked about teachers, when we needed more teachers with Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, do we need teachers? Or do we need guides? And the Buddha expected when he decided to teach, what did he decide to teach? Ask yourself and think about it from all you know about the Buddha. He decided to teach other people to do the investigation he did to see if they could see the way he saw how things work. That's what he did. Okay. So that was his basic material to teach other people. Finding teachers like this is very hard, very hard, because people want to be the teacher, the guru, and they want you to take what I say, absolute, and she's the guru. They call, they call me the guru this year, and I'm there like, don't call me the guru. I'm just a guide. I want to guide you. It's okay, I know they do it with respect, but it's tough, you know, because I'm not special. I just worked really hard and tested and tested and tested and really saw what this was and how it works. It changed my life completely, absolutely completely. Must have, I'm still doing it and it's 20 years. <laughs> Yeah, so, and it's still fun, and I still get letters from people. Oh, they say, it's real. And I can remember when I told Bonte that on the mountain. I knocked on his door one day. I came out of the forest after working and sitting, and I came back and early, and I said, I had tears in my eyes. I said, I thought it was just meditation. But this stuff is real. And he really did this. And this is a real person. And what he uncovered is the basis for understanding the brain and consciousness and behavior modification today. To me, he is the father of behavioral modification as a modality. He tells you how your mind works and how the body works. The mind and body is connected. He shows you how the feeling comes up, how it turns into something else, into an emotion, how you personally get involved with it, how you have mental proliferation. Think, 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 think about it. Papancha. And it rolls around in your head and gets worse and worse. Yeah? That's what it does. Then he shows you how to get out of it. You know what he said before I, I just... Uh, before what he said basically in uh, two things i told um, may earlier today in the anger nikaya the buddha i was hunting for things and then all of a sudden they just popped up in the anger nikaya i think it's a book of fours and i think it's number 125 it's fours or threes <laughs> but i think it's no it's I think it's threes, book of threes, sorry, because this is threes. And it's number 125. It says, the Buddha is speaking and he says, I do not teach a Dhamma without a basis. 
And then he says, I do not teach a Dhamma without knowledge. And I do not teach a Dhamma that is antidotal. Then he says in the next phrase, I teach a Dhamma that has a basis, his personal experience, his knowledge and vision, his ability to see how it was all working. That's what he's talking about. And I teach a Dhamma that has knowledge, knowledge he attained by seeing it, direct knowledge. See? And then he says, I teach a Dhamma that has the antidote. That's an important thing that I stumbled on. He's saying it right there. I went on the quest. I left my home. I went on the quest. I figured it out. I did come up with the answer. I understand it completely. That's what he decided to teach. You see? That's what he decided to teach. And then the other place we see this is we see it in the Chichaka Sutta where we have these five things, the two, the two sections in the Chichaka Sutta. There's a section and then you do it six times <laughs> for once for each one of, the, of the, um, the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body and the mind. You do it six times, okay? And in the last sections of that, he says, basically, dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises, the meeting of the three is eye contact. With eye contact as condition of feeling arises. When one is touched by a pleasant feeling, if one does not welcome it, remain holding to it, then one is not touched by lust. If one has a painful feeling come up, if one does not struggle with it and beat one's chest and cry about it, then one understands they are not touched by aversion. When one is touched by a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, if one does understand the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, danger, and the escape, ah, there it is. Then, from this kind of feeling, then the ignorance is gone. And when the ignorance is gone, the craving was gone in the first two, and the ignorance is gone. You see, it's gone. And so it basically is saying you have to understand any phenomena that comes up in your mind because that's where everything starts, right? It's where everything starts. Anything that comes up in your mind at all has an origination will be there with, and then have a disappearance. And you didn't make it come. You didn't sit there and say, it's time for me to be depressed. Come on, I haven't been depressed in five hours. I need to be depressed. Come on, and it comes up. You didn't do that. It just happened. The origination is impersonal. The disappearance is impersonal. If you just sat there and just kept doing what you were doing, said, oh, that's a funny thought, and you kept doing what you were doing, it would pass away. It disappeared. The gratification is the problem. The gratification means the personal involvement with the feeling that came up. And if the personal involvement, if I get involved with it, oh, I like it, I want it, I've got to have it, boy, I can't do anything until I get it, <laughs> you know, or, oh, I don't like this, it's going to be another bad night, this is going to happen, I'll look at this. I'm just projecting my whole evening and then it all comes to be just the way I project it in my head. It happens that I get sad and overwhelmed and pressed down. And I feel like it's all happening to me. It's not, it's happening from, you, <laughs> from your inside, your translation of it. So the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger. What's the danger of getting involved in it? That's an easy one. I get involved in it. I think it's me, my fault. I'm to blame. It's all about me. That's what I think. It's part of me. Okay, that's the danger. And you lose the present time. That's the biggest danger. You can't stay in the present time. 
Remember what I told you last time about the present time, do you all remember that? And the last part is, okay, I'm sorry, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape. So there he goes again. <laughs> he puts it right out there. There is, he found the escape. He tells you the escape. He had an escape. He gave you the right effort. And we lost it just because of modern dictionaries and modern cultural ideas. We turned effort into hard work and seriousness. And I have to make things happen. Effort is something you persevere and don't give up and all that. Well, I'm not saying you shouldn't pay attention to that, but that's a superficial, superficial definition of the word. Those last three pieces in the in the path, the last three pieces are, are really important. First one is the right effort, right, right effort, and then right mindfulness and concentration. Okay, we say harmonious observation. We say um, harmonious practice for right effort. We say harmonious, um, harmonious observation because we know what we're doing. He gave you an electron microscope. He's showing you how to even watch a rising consciousness is one at a time. You can do that too. That's how serious he was about this. And he's saying, watch, it's not you. You're not making it happen. It's impersonal. And then he says, um, concentration, but collectedness of mind, gentle collectedness of mind. And I'll go so far as not getting rid of the word concentration, I'm willing to say productive concentration so that I can watch and see how everything works. That's what I'm talking about, see, okay? So here we are, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape from all phenomena that arises in your mind. And everything, intention starts here of what I'm going to say and what I'm going to do. So it's starting at the top, trickling down. So I want to go over just the one thing because I've had several people ask me about this this week. And can I share a screen, Bhante Namagavesi? Yeah. Yes, you can share the screens. That's not wrong. Okay. Um, okay. What I'm going to talk to you just about for a couple minutes, just a couple minutes, because some of you have not seen this before, is um, lifeline is very important to understand the lifeline. Before we start talking to you about the other pieces, our next lesson is going to be specifically on the Donna and maybe on the Donna and seal it together. Okay? But before we ever teach you the dependent origination, and we get you to use seven pieces of it when you practice, but what I want you to look at first is what I teach before I teach that workshop. I teach you this. This is your lifeline that goes across here, okay? And this is you, depending on how old you are. You know, you're right here. And you're moving along in your life the whole time in this direction, see? Down the lifeline. <coughs> okay. As you're moving along, you have to stop a moment and you have to say to yourself, back here is the past and you have two words you need to define. Over here is the future. Okay? What does the past mean? 
when a little girl comes to you and says to you, this is my first spelling. Um, I have to learn the spelling and the word is P-A-S-T. Um, what does that word actually mean, you know? And so, um, why don't you tell me, May, just tell me, play with me a minute. What does past mean? What does past mean? You can make your microphone come on. What does um, the past mean? Something that's um, happened that's not going to happen again. Okay, it's, it's, already, it's already happened, all right? And, and it's not going to happen. Well, you don't know if it's going to happen again, but it's, it's already happened, just the past. Well, what else does it mean? It, it, can't happen, it can't happen the same way again? You say no, right? It can't happen the same way again, right? So what we, the big one we come up with when we ask people to tell us what the past means, it's already happened, already happened. It's past, it's, it's done. It's fixed in time. These are things that people will say to me and they'll say the energy um, is done, is gone, the gone, it's gone. The energy of that past event like this back here, it's already done, it's over, it's gone. It's already happened and it's fixed in time. We agree? Yeah? Okay. Now, try again. Tell me what the word future means. Somebody tell me uh, what the word future means. Yeah, go so ahead. So it, yeah, it's something that we don't, we don't know yet. Um, we don't know. And well, if we say that the past, the energy is gone, then the future, similar, well, not similarly, but th there's no energy um, happening for that right happen now. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that energy, it's not here yet. It's not here. Not here yet. And no energy yet. Okay, that's good, that's good. And then this one here, this one is called the present. And this, this, this piece here is you. And actually, we could say that, um, I actually wanna change that a minute. Let's see, we can, we can do this. Um, I have to make this, this guy a little bit different. Because this guy actually is a car, oops, wait a minute. <laughs> this guy, um, oh, come on. There and there. Uh, where you are on here, you have a little car. And um, see, you have a little car. Here's your lights, little window, okay. So uh, you're actually, it looks like you're going the other way, but that's okay, I'm not a good drawer. But what I wanna show you is you're going this way along life's road, okay, that's where you're going. And the present time um, is real interesting because what's in the past is done, it's fixed in time. And the little girl might say, can I change it? And you say, no, you can't change it. Can I shape it different? No, you can't shape. Can I paint it a different color? No, it already happened, see? And, and the future, you can't tell me what it is? No, I can't tell you. I don't know because we're not there yet. It could be anything. Your future actually looks like this now. With quantum physics, your future looks like this. <laughs> you don't know where you're going. Because what's happening in your life right now, whatever you do here determines where you go here, or do you go there, or do you go there? What you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. Yeah? 
That's what we know is true. So you're in the present, and what we know about the present is what you think and ponder on that determines the inclination of your mind. Well, that's interesting. So what you think and ponder on, that is what determines what you're gonna do in the future. Yeah? Okay. So in order, you know, are you gonna smile in the future? <laughs> Or are you going to frown in the future? What you decide, because the truth is you're very powerful and you are the one that is going to decide what's going to happen in the future. But the interesting part about this chart is that the truth of it is the only place on this chart that you are actually alive is right here in the present time. And when we look up the word in the dictionary for alive, you're going to find something in the definition about life continuum. And it's gonna insinuate something, the present is where you are right now on the life continuum. In some of the dictionaries, we found that. Now, the second part of this little tiny doc is like this. Everybody, gets, well, everybody gets one cup or one pitcher of energy of energy to use each day. This is how the universe operates. If I was trying to explain it to you, it operates by one cup of energy each day. You are fully in charge of this energy. The question is, what will you do with this energy, your personal energy each day of your life? Are you going to spend one third of your energy on the past? And then give away another third of your energy to the future. But you just told me that the future isn't here yet and the past is fixed in time and it's all gone. So the question is how will you shape the present time as you go through the day? You only have one third of energy left if you do this which explains a lot about personal relationships. <laughs> because when the husband comes home and he walks through the door and he's totally exhausted and he wants the kids to be quiet and the dog to go away and he doesn't want to talk, he doesn't want to do anything but rest, that's because he spent his energy the wrong way that day, okay? And he probably, gave it away to the future and past thoughts. Worries about the future right now, a lot of people have worries about the future and it can just take them over. And then the past, they get upset about the past and there's two diseases. One disease is called the disease of the past is I should have, I could have, I would have done this if only. Wow. So it's called shoulda, coulda, woulda, itis. It's a serious infection in the brain. And this means itis in medical terminology. Itis means irritation of the shoulda, coulda, woulda part of your brain. You're always thinking about what I should have done, what I would have done, what I could have done, but that's past. It's back here. These things happen behind you. Now, one thing about this car that's going along is it has, um, it has a, a, a trunk, see, a trunk. 
I can't do very well with that, but it has a trunk. And the question is, are you going to take all these things from the past and are you going to collect them and put them in the trunk and carry them with you and expect the car to be able to run smoothly? <laughs> the car is going to get so heavy because you're storing all the stuff in the trunk and you're carrying around all your past problems and you're going to relive them, relive them, relive them. But you can't change them because we said they're fixed in time, they're done, they can't be changed. You can't do anything about them. You can learn from them. What we can learn from them is we should get them out of the trunk and not do that anymore. Okay, that's what we should learn. Then the other one is the future. If you take the future, okay, and start worrying about it, oh, you know, I got this one thought, this one thought is um, this thought about what I'm gonna, oops, what I'm gonna do, um, what I'm gonna do here, and then what I'm gonna do there, what I'm gonna do there, what I'm gonna do there. And you put all of these in the front seat with you. And you keep thinking about them, and now there's no place for you to sit when you're driving. You're going to be very uncomfortable on the ride. That's <laughs> very bad. But if you just pay attention to the present time and you let these other things go, you let them go, you let them go. And just let the future come as it may. And you, you can plan for the future. You can work out a plan, but don't get stuck with all of this. Don't get stuck with that, okay? Just take care of, oops. Just take care of the present. And if you do that, tomorrow when you get up, you're gonna have a whole entire glass full of pink energy. Pink's my favorite color. <laughs> pink energy. And it, you're gonna have the whole thing to yourself for the present to do what you have to do, but you're only gonna have to do it one step at a time. So this is the little drawing. And one guy at the, the uh, Veterans Administration, he got all excited about this. He said, I'm gonna make coffee cups and I'm gonna give it to the people at the Veterans Administration. And it shows, are you gonna give, keep your energy for one day or are you gonna give a third of it to the past, a third of it to the future and try and live with only a third for the present? Uh-uh, no. They're gonna, other side of the cup, it says present like this, present. On the, on the other side of the cup, is a picture like that down the cup. Only the present, I'm gonna live in the present. Not heavy, simple way to relieve yourself, simple way to, um, to, to, to look at this whole thing and think about I only have to carry around with me what's in the present time as you go through the day. So what is the past really? When we're working in life, we should keep in mind that the past is, um, technically when you're at lunch, you have a past from the morning. <laughs> so don't drag your morning into lunchtime and remember that's a new present time, right? And when you go home at night, you don't have to work through your mind all over again what happened in the morning and at lunchtime now you're in the evening one guy wrote me a letter and he said the solution to this is when you come home you walk in he was strange he says i walk in the house and i hang up my my coat on the coat rack and when i hang up my coat i hang up everything from the morning and afternoon and then I come into my house, my hat is put on the rack and I hang up my coat and I'm here right now. And man, he changed his whole life. He's, that was his, his little simile. And he said, everybody needs a coat rack in the hallway. And everybody needs to remember when you hang up your coat, 
that's hanging up your morning, hanging up the afternoon, and then all you have is the evening. So you can be happy and you can do things. So we have choice. There definitely is choice. And the choice is the vo word volition, they say they use that word. And our volition is, the, the European said, the truth will set you free. That's very famous in the philosophical circles of, of Europe, right? So what does the Buddhist say? The knowledge and the truth will set me free. The knowledge and vision of how things actually work sets me free. The European says to be or not to be, that is the question. Oh my goodness, they're thinking about the present and the morning and the evening and they're debating everything. And I say to crave and cling or not to crave and cling, that is my question every single time. To crave and cling or not to crave and cling. You have that, you can do it a thousand times a day. And let go, let go. Even if you believe in your heart, somebody hates you, really hates you, and they're saying something to you, can you just send them loving kindness and take a look at them? And funny thing, if they're yelling at you and they hate you, a lot of times they're talking about themselves, they're not talking about you. you if you know the person, sometimes you can figure that out. You watch it around in groups of people, you watch how this works, it's very funny. It's just the way it works. They're actually frustrated with themselves and so they tell, you know, oh, you get me so angry because you don't remember and you don't do things on time and this, blah, 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 all that stuff. And maybe that's them, maybe they're late to work and they don't do things on time, it's very funny. If you watch people in an office, people tell me they can see how that works with the people that are a bunch of people in an office working together. And then the person doesn't like you and they come unloading on you. And they're actually talking about themselves. The best suggestion you can make to them is, is kind of just smile to yourself and wait until they're done and say, okay, yeah, I get it. You want to go get some coffee and donuts or do you want to go get some ice cream? <laughs> yeah, do you want to? And let it go, you know, let it go. So um, that's the lesson for today. Do you have any questions? We got about five minutes left. If you have a question from the sutta or you want to write a question, you can. Um, this sutta gave us a look at how he was using the uh, part. Yeah? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, no, we learned the eightfold path. In, in this sutta, it says uh, 10. Uh, virtues. So this is the addition had, of two more. Had, no, he had 10 pieces. He said the path was his reason. I, I knew somebody was going to do that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, the, the 10 pieces and I, did I get to that in my notes? I don't know if I got to my, my notes or not. It's winding around the eight pieces. I might have to write you on this because I think it's going to take me a little time to put it, to put the pieces together. It's near the end. It involves the, the, um, the wholesome side and the wholesome side and you're doing some things on the unwholesome part and then you're doing some things on the wholesome part and then you're letting it all go and the intention was the last part. So you had these four pieces and four pieces and two, the, the pieces for the, um, uh, and I'll write it out for you after we're finished and I'll send it to you in an email. I know it's, it's kind of hard to see it because it's not like chunky where it gave you a whole list, you know, where the 12 pieces are right there or 128 with the, with the hindrances, but there are 10 pieces. I was struggling with that earlier because I'm there, where are the 10 pieces, you know? <laughs> but the 10 pieces are here. It is on the last page, Sister Kema. It's on the last page, in the last paragraph. Uh, it is like eightfold path, knowledge uh, of he, one oh, beyond right, training doctor, and right deliverance. Oh, good, good, good work, good work. So what he did was he, look at the last, sent, the last uh, paragraph. So it says, 
it says write intention and then write speech for the uh, uh, the right speech and then it says um, right action right livelihood then then it says right effort and then um, where are we? right concentration right mindfulness and right concentration that's eight okay and then he says right knowledge of beyond training and right deliverance of one beyond training so it's right knowledge at the end and right deliverance added to add that to the eightfold path that's your 10 pieces so that's what he's telling you, you have to you have to learn how this whole thing is operating and how we talked about how you let go of it let go of the whole thing and let go and let go and let go and you're using the um the six r's to do it you're using the solution is for abandoning it is the six hours every time. That's your answer. You have to, and you know, take our harmonious ones, you know, and use it in place of right. I read it to you just now, but you would say to gain your harmonious, okay, let's do it. Gain your harmonious uh, perspective, your harmonious imaging, your harmonious communication, the harmonious movement of mind's attention, harmonious movement of mind's attention is operating correctly, the harmonious uh, livelihood, the harmonious practice, which is right effort, the harmonious um, observation, and then the harmonious level of concentration or harmonious collectedness, whichever way you want to look at it. Some people, you know, really get upset if we don't keep that word concentration. It's very funny. So the harmonious lifestyle, uh, harmonious livelihood is uh, la harmonious lifestyle. That's right. Harmonious lifestyle. Right. Okay. Livelihood changes to lifestyle. That's how it works. Okay. Anybody else? Question? Yeah? Yep. Um, Sister Kema, I have two questions. So the first question is um, coming back to the lifeline um, description just now. You yeah. mentioned what we think and ponder on that determines what we do in the future. So is that harmonious imaging then? No, not no, but you're mixing about. Okay, the first one is what you think and ponder on um geez that's what sets up the inclination of your mind that one's coming from 20 the 20 wait a second i get it for you 21 no right 20 sorry 20 i think it's 20. What you think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind. And you see, if everything starts with mind, the inclination of mind is the direction the mind is leaning in. So you're attempting to make it lean in the wholesome direction to pull yourself away from the unwholesome and then end up with just total complete balance and equanimity at the six in the end. So you're living naturally using using uh, the wholesome of everything. But you see this one, the sutta that we did, if you notice something about it, um, the way it's stating at the end, um, ascetic, invincible, uh, an ascetic who is invincible attains to the supreme attainment. When he reaches the supreme attainment at the very end, you're letting go of everything, but you're still alive uh, and you're still, and this is a funny thing, how this is really a fun talk to talk about how people have changed uh, what happens to the person who's the Arahat. Uh, but and uh, Sister Kim, yeah. uh, would this come under a right uh, uh, view? or uh, kind of perspective or uh, the no, right, right, uh, uh, no, it, thoughts, harmonious, or imaging. imaging. Harmonious imaging, it's intention. 
the inclination of your mind, the intention, the images you hold in your mind are all pure, all clear. When I say that they get mixed up about arahatship, sometime one guy said, well, the Buddha, he was gone. I said, what do you mean he was gone? Well, he became an arahat, he disappeared. I said, well, then what happened to the 45 years he was teaching? <laughs> I was like, wait, what happened here? And he said, well, I get, when you're an arahat, I mean, you're, there's nothing left of you. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this, he's getting mixed up with what happens when the Buddha is, the body of the Buddha is gone. He's mixing it up with the story of the sandcastle and how the sandcastle is on the seashore and the arahat die when the arahat passes away the body is finished like a wet log on the side of the road it's useless it's, the body's gone he can never come back and make the castle again like when the water comes up from the ocean and it washes that sand castle away that you and i built you can never put it back together again the same exact way it was ever again it's gone that's the arahat ship, the end of the arahat ship and fruition but the person got confused and they didn't have enough knowledge and information. So they decided that when the Buddha became an arahat, he, was, he, died, he wasn't there anymore. And I said, well, then how did he teach all this? And he says, oh, people made it up. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> the guy didn't really understand what was happening. The other thing is, if the Buddha was an arahat, how could he ever smile? Now, the arahat will not smile this way. But the arahat was obviously smiling a lot at the humor of life. Trust me on this. Your your the smile that is on the was now. Let me point this out. Was on the Buddha statues that they made. Always had a smile. But now, when I was in Texas uh, six or eight years ago, I was in Texas at a place talking about Buddhism, and they had a picture of a Buddha in a hallway who looked like. If, he, if I didn't know better, I would have said he was so sad as the devil, he just didn't have horns, you know. And I was, it was in a Christian church in a hallway. <laughs> and the thing was, the guy looked so sad. He was devastatingly sad. And I'm there like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, we are the happy ones. And, and, we, and the thing of it is, uh, when you ask yourself, how did the monks get the uh well someday i'll show you that but how did the monks get the botanical gardens away from the kings so that the monks could stay in the bot botanic the big botanical gardens like if you're in in malaysia imagine the king giving us the uh botanical garden in kuala lumpur for 500 monks to go stay and camp there for three months for the rains retreat how did that happen what is it that possessed the king to give this garden to the buddha and all his monks when the people of the city were there and they were going to walk through and see these monks and the story is right there in one of the suttas it's right there and it tells you exactly what happened and why uh, King Pasanati gave this big botanical garden to the monks and they came there for like 17 years, I think it was, all together during the 45 years. They were 17 years they spent rains retreat there. But why did he allow it? These are ascetics and it tells you the story. And you know, the thing about it is they were smiling when they were walking, when they were talking. You were clean good-natured humor like children have simple humor there's humor i don't know any of the older monks that don't have a sense of humor when you get to know them i've known many of these monks the burmese and thai and um you know chinese monks and stuff they have a sense of humor you know the ones that were very old i didn't know they would and they did now sometimes today it's like i'm a monk i am not going to smile mm. Mm. No matter what, I will not smile. <laughs> it's like, why not? It's not, why not? It's fine, you know? So what is the danger in the smiling? Or is the danger in clinging, craving and clinging the smile? You see, and if you have no craving and clinging left, you can still smile. I was giving an example of um, this one big teacher and he walked down a path and he saw an orchid opening perfectly and came back and told another monk, when you go down the path to sit today, 
notice the orchid, it's there and it opened because everybody was watching it. It came out and it's beautiful and it's, it's just delightful. If you smell it, it's just delightful. And, but he wasn't holding on to it. He was just pointing out the fact the orchid opened, stop and see it, you know, because then it's gone. So you see it and then it's gone. We grew up holding on to everything. Now we have somebody saying, you don't have to hold on to it. Enjoy the present time. Enjoy the present time. Don't get caught with the present moment. That's silly. It's a cliche. Maybe it's possible for the, for the Arahat with the 10 fruitions. <laughs> Maybe so. But the point is, that's just silly. Look at your watch. Can you, can you um, stay in the moment? Try staying in the second. Watch your second hand. And wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Or you can go up. Oh, there goes. There goes. There goes. There goes. Can you stay in a, in a second? Of course not. It's a cliche. It's a fun thing we say in Buddhism. And in, in your practice, we, we can watch a rising. When I say you can learn to watch a rising consciousness, you can, but you have to develop the observation skill to the level where it can observe this. It's, the brain doesn't stop and get slower. We checked that. So it's still producing what goes on in the function of your body but it doesn't stop firing you don't stop firing your brain until it turns off in sensation and then turns back on that's about the only time that happens but but what i'm trying to say is that you you can watch this because your observation becomes so sharp that you can see the little sparks coming up and like that coming up and down up and down when you get to certain levels you can actually watch it going fire fire what is that as it's going across the little thing jumping like that is basically a different consciousness is coming up it's there and now it goes away it comes up and then it's there and it goes away you're watching a Nietzsche origination and the disappearance of it that happens that yeah, question. she has a second question also yeah okay second question go ahead <laughs> yes thank you Bhante <laughs> Actually, the second, <laughs> the second question is related to the first question on harmonious imaging. So Bhante no, um, sometimes mentioned in his talks that the entire Eightfold Path is in the six Rs. Or, yeah. um, so which part, I'm curious, which part of the six Rs is harmonious, harmonious imaging? Is it certain steps or is it the whole of it? And if it's certain steps, then can we play, can we pay close attention to those steps? Because that's related to what we chart in our lifeline. No, no, it's like the pieces of an engine and you just run it. It just starts running automatically through, okay? The, when you start to break, try to break it down, it reminds me of the woman who was in London and she felt that she could be totally enlightened if she could just see all 12 links in dependent origination. We tried to explain she didn't need to be doing that. And she should take the seven links and work with them instead. And then eventually she might see the uh, formations, uh, 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 formations, consciousness, mentality, materiality, those would be able to see later. And that's about the way it works. But in this case, like with, um, with the, uh, what you're, if I sent you a little car to put together from the, uh, from the bookstore, they have these little model cars and I got one and I sent it to you to put together and your favorite part was um, say the tailgate or it was the windshield or it was the steering wheel in the car. Okay. Should we just concentrate on, on, the, on the steering wheel and be able to drive the car? No. No. <laughs> okay. It's like you might have the most beautiful windows in town, but it doesn't make the car uh, run better. Do you kind of get what I'm saying? The Eightfold Path was a connected thing. Uh, they like to talk about it in three sections of the sila, the, the uh, morality, uh, the, the morality, and then the um, building up the wisdom. And then the actual practice part is at the bottom, the three, three pieces at the bottom. So you have these three parts. But in the original suttas, it only brought that up lightly. It's showing you pieces. Do, I know, did you remember, let me put it this way. 
Bonte explained it this way. If you take a piece of paper from your notebook, okay, and we take this piece of paper, okay, and we pull it out, okay, let's see, pull it out, right? Oops, I'm going to pull it out, right? Okay, so I pull this out, and I'm going to fold this paper, and I'm going to make this paper into a fan, okay? Now I'm going to make it into an eight-fold path. So I'm taking the paper and I'm folding it in half. I'm going to fold it in half again, like that. I'm going to fold it in half again, like this. Let's always remember this about the Eightfold Path because it's very, very important. This Eightfold Path does not help to get you to where you want to go unless you have all of the eight folds in it operating. Okay, so now we take it apart and we make it Fold it this way so that they'll open, okay? And then when we open this up, we have this now. I'm, I'm at a big meeting and I forgot my fan. <laughs> so I'm having this and I just made a fan that is actually large enough for me to make wind and I can now fan myself and I can feel the air, okay? But when we start dissecting the Eightfold Path and sort of flippantly saying, okay, three of these pieces had to do with Sila. Oh, okay, so we don't need them anymore because they were Sila and we learned that. So we're going to take that off and say, Sila, we learned at home. Okay, now I take my little fan and something is wrong because... <laughs> There's not enough left to make anything in the air. I have to go like this because there's nothing left. And then we might decide, well, those other pieces, we're going to take those two out. And we're only going to keep our practice people, our only practice part. But see, the problem is that all of those pieces were supporting these practice pieces. And if we take those pieces away and we're not activating them, working those through at the same time. Much of it might, like for instance, Sila, once you learn it and you're practicing it all the time, becomes pretty automatic, doesn't it? So you don't have to think about all that much, but you still should be say, saying your precepts to remind yourself. But you see, now I can't get any air. <laughs> it's hopeless. I can't use my ear. Yeah, there I can cool my ear and that's all. <laughs> so this idea of saying, Sila is something we don't have to worry about is not quite right because when we look at how we were talking about the first ones, we were saying um, this first one is very important. The, the uh, harmonious perspective is adopting the an anatta perspective. Next time we come, I'll write it down right now in my book, but next time that um, we come, we'll take the Eightfold Path and we'll put it on a chart, okay? And we will look at the Eightfold Path to see how it works as a structure supporting, see? It's kind of like the, um, uh, the uh, uh, precepts and hindrances. If we teach the precepts to you growing up and we don't talk to you about the hindrances I noticed in Sri Lanka until you're about nine years old and then we start talking to you about the hindrances because we start teaching you the meditation at about nine years old in the Sunday school. Then we're going to talk to you about the distractions. But that's kind of a mistake because we just took those two subjects and we didn't teach them together. Because the truth is that the precepts are like an umbrella. And if you open up the umbrella, um, you're underneath it, underneath the umbrella. And then the the hindrances come to attack you. If you're keeping your precepts, they can't get in. But if you have a hole in the umbrella and the, 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 or you don't have, keep the precepts, the hindrances are just pounding you and bothering you all the time. So you have to work on understanding that the hindrances and precepts are interrelated. Look at your precepts, write down the five precepts. And then cross one out and say, I broke that. Beside the precepts, write the hindrances. Tell me what's going to happen if you cancel one of those precepts. Look at each one of the hindrances and tell me what's going to come up. And they come up not just one for one, but if you kill something, for instance, 
uh, like you did it intentionally, what happens is you feel um, guilt, restlessness, guilt, and the restlessness, guilt, and remorse comes up. Also, when you go to work, you start feeling guilty, you'll get sloth and torpor and start getting a sleepy mind at school and you won't want to participate in the classes. And then you start not paying attention. You see what I'm saying? So these, these and then uh, there's a, one of them is, first of all, you had hatred when you did it. So that one is going to keep popping up in your mind. I really hated, that's why I did that. You see? So you have to, these things are all functional. Remember that these groups and everything, they're all functional. And so when you start looking at how they apply into situations in life, and you go away, I used to have the students go away and come back in Sunday school and tell me what they did this week and how did they use their precepts. And when they broke their precepts, if they did, then tell me what happened. And they would tell me what happened. And we would look at the hindrances that came up. So they come up in groups after you. That's how it works. Okay, anybody else got a question? I will do that for you, May, in the next one. I'll draw it out because if we don't have any questions, do we want to say the prayer? <laughs> uh, I have a question. Okay, one more question. Yeah? Uh, just wonder how you teach uh, the third precepts to child. I think, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's quite hard for us here to teach that on Sunday school. <laughs> Well, the third priest is strong sexual activity, okay? And you don't have to go into the deeper part of it, but you don't do anything to anyone that hurt, uh, like with children, you don't want to be touching people, touching the children, touching each other in different parts of the body. That's about all I did in Sunday school when I was talking. But the, I, I have a, um, one of our Sunday school, oh, she just disappeared. I was going to ask her what they did there <laughs> you know we can, we can maybe consult some people and see what they're what they're actually saying you know but you're saying the whole precept very few people talk about because the whole precept goes like this in there it's in some some of the suttas it lays it all out i was going to do that when we got to um that in an installment but it'll say you don't have wrong sexuality commit wrong sexuality um, and then you break it down. This means that you don't have sex with someone else's mate, in other words, committing adultery, okay, or someone else's partner, which is going to cause a lot of strife, okay. And then you don't have sex with somebody who is young and still living with their parents. That's another part of it. And the basic, the bottom line of the whole thing about wrong sexuality is you do not do anything in a, of a sexual nature with anyone who, where it causes um, suffering, meaning sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair to yourself, the partner, um, or any of the relatives around it or the people around you. You have to be concerned with this. One of the situations I had to deal with was somebody who wanted to go out with somebody that her parents said, you absolutely can't go out with this person. And I, I just, I can't tell her what to do, but I can tell her basically what will happen if you do it. If you guys, um, you know, get involved and you do get involved like this, you're, you, you have to understand it's going to affect your parents. And if you were to get married, it's going to follow you all the way through your life. Because I had also counseled older people who had done this and it was still following them around in their life, you see. After having four kids and visiting the in-laws, it was still a problem forever because the parents on one side didn't want the people to get married. So it's like, um, I know the breakaway thing and do what you want and all of that. It's just something that you need to look at and see how is it going to work before you jump in into the fire with it. Because uh, relationships, um, there are all kinds of relationships in the world. You have planned relationships in advance where they do turn out pretty well sometimes. Sometimes they don't. Okay. Then you have the famous one where your pheromones are jumping and the guy's pheromones are jumping and boo, we got to be together. You know? And that's good when maybe you're together a couple times, but afterwards, 
and Nietzsche comes in and, <laughs> you know, it's not that interesting anymore and it doesn't last. That stuff might last even a few years if you got married, but then it's not going to last. It doesn't hold the whole thing up. Right now, from my own life experience, all I can say to you is I'm sort of interested in the idea of both of you visiting a nice psychologist or a psychiatrist one time and going over where you are about marriage, where they are about marriage, and just looking, just to see the two sides that you didn't talk about. And then the two of you together talk to the person and see what happens as far as, is it gonna work? You see, because there's such a high rate in the world of jumping in the fire, dancing around and getting the divorce very shortly after. <laughs> really, really crazy, you know? <laughs> Just crazy in America. We had a book and the book was um, uh, C. Jane and C. Dick Run. C. Jane and C. Dick Run. And so this was like, see, there's Jane and there's Dick and see them run and see them play and everything. They grow up, they have the dog, the dog's name is Spot, and they get married and they have the perfect home and the perfect family and everything's perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, except it doesn't work anymore to tell people that in America because see Dick, see John, and they run and they play and they have the dog Spot and they get married one time. And then after a few years, they get a divorce and they get married the second time. And this is my second mom. And it's crazy. It's crazy. Now, it isn't, it isn't true everywhere. But when I come to Asia, it's so much nicer because I see the structure. And I think it can be too confining sometimes. But I think there's some, to, some good things about it in the way that people are holding together and working through the marriage contract. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's all a thing about the, the, there's all different variations in the world. You know, you should talk to Perel about this. <laughs> she should talk to you about it. You know, because I can only tell you in my impression, I'm delighted with the balance of children that are in good homes. Not, I don't mean rich homes, but I mean in a good family setup. I'm delighted with what I see in the adjustment of children in Asia. I thought I would see more of issues, but in the very poor quarter, sometimes I see these beautiful children that are well balanced because of the family structure, even though they're poor. Okay, and it goes across the demographic line. It's a very interesting question, you know. But that that suit that that precept with the children, I should ask Bonte for you. How about if I ask him? I'll, I'll ask him, because he gave me an answer on this once and I don't remember it. Let me ask, okay? He's good at looking at that. Does anybody else have a question? Hey, dear Pedro. Yep. Anybody else? I have a, I have a question in the, uh, second last page. Yeah. Uh, he says uh, that once you enter the second jhana, then yep. you are uh, uh, wholesome uh, uh, intentions are remainderless. But uh, even beyond second jhana, we do have loving kindness and uh, compassion and joy, which are wholesome. Uh, States. Um, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, do these wholesome intentions originate from the origin? Uh, they should be said to originate from perception. What perception? Though perception is multiple, varied, and different in aspects, there is perception of renunciation, perception of um, perception, perception of loving kindness and perception of uh, compassion, wholesome intentions originate from this. Is that what you mean? Is that where you are? No, no, no. I'll tell you. What page? What paragraph? Yeah, yeah. One second. What number? Do you have the number? The yes. section? Section Is number? There? 13. 662, 13. Section number 13. 13. Yes. 13, the second last paragraph. In 14? 13, 13. One, three. one three. I'm sorry, say it again. Page 652. Yep. Number 13. One yep. Three. The second last paragraph. 
And where do these wholesome intentions cease without remainder? Their cessation is stated here with the stilling of applied, uh, of thinking and examining thought that the, the, um, the monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and, and um, singleness of mind without the thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born but, of... Uh, that is there on the first jhana also, uh, yeah. Bharat. Without cessation. Uh, yeah. is, that is there also on the uh, first jhana also that is mentioned, no? Uh, this wholesome intention sees without reminder. Yeah, that is unwholesome. And this is One is unwholesome and the other is wholesome. But remember what I said about the wholesome is for the advanced meditator that's gone from, like if we were saying the pendulum like this, has gone from here to pull this, this down toward the six. And you're learning, teaching yourself to live in the wholesome, wholesome, wholesome. You come down into the balancing point and they're talking about ceasing without remainder is actually going through to the um, uh, cessation. Arahatship, going through to the end, cessation. It's, it's, it's here are these wholesome cease without remainder. It's not just cessation. Cease without remainder is is then is then the attainment, the higher attainments. So it's talking in respect to that. Do you get it? Okay. Okay. What I'm there are other sutras also which says uh, that uh, cessation is possible on the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana, and arupa jhana. In each uh, right. arupa jhana, it is possible. Yeah. So, so uh, it's been trying, you know, from anybody who can get to the first jhana has the potential to trigger cessation at that point. But it all has to do with the amount of this. You see, the unwholesome and the wholesome, and, and to go into cessation has to come down to go like that. That's the picture way of looking at it. Okay, okay, good, okay. You're setting yourself up for that, yeah, okay. <laughs> Anybody else, okay? Anybody else? Okay, then let's have a closing prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I didn't remember my bell. Thank you. <laughs> okay.